doctor en medicina. Dirige el grupo de investigación Digital Neuroanatomy del Instituto Max Planck, donde se ha centrado en la anatomía funcional de los circuitos en el cerebro. Recibió el Premio Nobel de Fisiología y Medicina en el año 1991. Vino a la Argentina en el marco del simposio Fronteras en Biociencia, organizado por el Ministerio de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación Productiva de la Nación. Como siempre en, en el programa en Científicos de Industria Argentina, eh, la idea es, por supuesto, conversar con los científicos que trabajan en nuestro país y también con aquellos científicos argentinos que trabajan en el exterior. Pero es imposible sustraerse de la tentación sistemáticamente cuando hay un premio Nobel en la Argentina, cualquiera sea la razón que lo haya traído a nuestras tierras, es una excelente oportunidad para poder conversar con ellos y entender por qué están en el país, qué los trajo y cómo fue la experiencia de conseguir un premio Nobel. Por eso es que hoy aquí en Científicos de Industria Argentina está el doctor Bert Sackman. Y quiero empezar preguntándole justamente eso. Él obtuvo el premio Nobel en el año 1991, premio Nobel de Medicina. Uh, let's go ourselves now back 21 years ago, 19, yes. 1991. I think it was on a Monday and uh, I usually, as usually, prepared an experiment. Uh -huh. and since I'm an electrophysiologist, I was pulling electrodes. Uh -huh. And then my secretary came and said, there's a call from uh, Stockholm. Now it happened that one of my uh, doctoral students had a postdoc in, uh, did a postdoc in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And he was not all that happy. I said, oh, again, complaints, you know, what, what, what can I do? And I was <laughs> sort of reluctant. Uh -huh. But then she said, well, you better come. And then they told me uh, that I shared a Nobel Prize with, uh, with uh, Alvin Nea. And then there was complete chaos for the rest of the day. I couldn't work anymore, you know, I mean. Well, um, you could take the yeah, day yeah. off. <laughs> you were well, uh, kind of. Yes, but uh, it was pretty cha chaotic. I don't remember exactly what, what happened. The only joke I have to tell was that one of your colleagues, mm -hmm. a reporter from uh, one of the major stations, asked me, uh, did you expect the call from Oslo? And I said, you better work up your geography, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you wrote something and I'm in your autobiography, mm -hmm. and, and I'm quoting you, so that's why I have to read, that biological cybernetics was a field that fascinated many students of biology and physics. And so what happened, you bit? What happened is that I had the chance to join a laboratory yes. that was officially doing cybernetics, you know, cybernetics is uh, the attempt to um, take concepts of engineering, mm -hmm. translate it in, into uh, biology, mm -hmm. in uh, mechanisms of, you know, sensory experience. And I very uh, rapidly realized that there's a lot of experimental work to be done in order to do cybernetics. Mm -hmm. And I got very, very immediately fascinated by the, uh, you know, the um, experimental work. Mm -hmm. Cybernetics was a bit of a, uh, let's say, a, uh, an exercise in engineering to look at phenomena and try to explain it in terms where, in, you know, using the black box approach. Mm -hmm. And when you see what's happening in the brain, at least in my case, you want to do, find more about what's mm -hmm. really going on than rather, uh, rather doing experiments than treat it as a black box. Now, I, naturally, I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. I'm a mathematician. Yes? Yes. But the so thing so you, you should know what uh, cybernetics is. It's a big field. It was it's a, a big, big field. It was I know. a big field. Yes, but uh, I'm not, I was going to ask you, do you work with mathematical models? Uh, well, I wouldn't call, let's say we simulate a lot. You because simulate a lot. We simulate a lot because the phenomena have become so complex mm -hmm. that, uh, especially if you want to have a bit of an overview of, and that's what I'm doing since the last uh, 10 years, you have to use, uh, I wouldn't call them mathematical models, but you have to put it into 
uh, in silico, we call it, <laughs> first, of all, uh, first of all to document it and second to try out several possibilities mm -hmm in silico mm -hmm. of how a phenomenon might occur before you do the next experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, the dream is to have a mathematical model, but uh, it seems that most biological phenomena are still so complex. And too many variables. Too, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Too many variables. Uh, That's well, what I see from the outside yes, looking yes, in. Yes. I don't know, you have to tell but, me. But uh, we still make an attempt, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, they are very useful to tell you what you don't know and what you should do next. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, uh, it, again, I'm very interested in that. I try to do it, but we collaborate mm -hmm. with other people who do this um, perfectly well, you know. And that's uh, uh, a, a trend in modern science, at least in neuroscience, that you have several groups some of them providing the data, some of them trying to quanti properly quantify them mm -hmm. and find, put them in silico and finally try to make a reasonable model. Um, it explains it. That it. It doesn't explain, but it simulates it properly. You know? mm -hmm. I don't think we have reached a stage where we can see uh, in what you would call emerging properties. Mm -hmm. You know, By looking at the mathematics, mm -hmm. suddenly you see a part uh, of this model that is not expected from looking at individual parts and the emergence of, of uh, no, well emergent properties is a is a field that is very uh, much debated what is an emergent property but in, ter in the um, nervous system it's quite clear that the interaction of many neurons leads to um, new phenomena or new abilities of this network mm -hmm. that you wouldn't expect on the basis of knowing each each neuron. I so you, you, you must know this as a math mathematician. Yes, but I am, you know what I'm curious? Mm -hmm. And I am trying to pick your brain on this. I'm pretty sure that you must have observed something. All of a sudden you have an experiment running and you're seeing, you're watching at something. You said, and something occurs in your brain. It says, I'm going to try something different. I got to twist this. I got to... Yes. to all the time, this all happens the time. all the time. Well, uh, maybe not all the time, but let's say you observe something, then you do it again, and then it's very exciting because uh, you think you have discovered yes. a new phenomenon, but then the rest of the year is spent to, sol to make it solid, you know? Yes. So, uh, in, let's say, experimental or scientific work, you have one or two or three times per year, you have these moments where you think, oh, nice, I have understood something, mm -hmm. and the rest of the time is spent make sure that it's right. It's right. And in many cases, it's not. It's not. What did we know 21 years ago when you got the Nobel Prize, and now that was, what was new? I mean, like in this last 20 years? Well, for me, the most fascinating developments are twofold. It's the uh, use of optical t uh, tools mm -hmm. to look in the in vivo brain, so in the living brain, not in a uh, dish, to look at what we would call synaptic transmission. That's the interaction yes. between uh, between uh, cells, uh -huh. and um, the uh, at, at least for me, one of the most fascinating discoveries is that small subcellular organelles called spines, this is where the synapses are, are individual compartments which are probably the sites where memory is stored. Wow. Probably. That's, that, that's one. The other exciting... That is incredible. Yes. How do well, you found it, that? It, well, uh, well, many people have worked on that. Again, one has to be careful to say not everywhere where there is a spine there is memory. Mm -hmm. It's probably the pattern of spines or of, of, of synapses mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, responsible for memory. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not, as we thought for a long time, very re reductionistic that it's mm. all spines. It's a few spines at in, uh, important points of the, at important locations of the, of the neuron. So that's one uh, thing I would, uh, and this is deep, completely due to the discover to new methods mm -hmm. of, staining cells and observing cells. The other exciting 
uh, news is obviously that we can look now into the living brain yes. with uh, MRI and fMRI. And 3D, also, 3D technology, technology, probably. But um, one has to be a bit uh, cautious about that um, because one basically looks at the blood flow and how the blood flow or, or the oxygenation of blood as it changes, as it flows through the brain, and how this is related to cognitive processes is not known at all, at all. So it's more, in my opinion, it's more like an a, um, uh, anatomical technique to tell the researcher where in the brain there is an increased blood flow, which is probably increased with, um, uh, which is probably um, uh, associated with some sort of a cognitive function, but it does not explain the cognitive function. It's more of an anatomical technique. Another uh, field, and then I'll stop, uh, mm. is the recognition of um, areas in the brain where that are responsible for cognitive maps. If we orient ourselves mm -hmm. in our environment, we have an internal map that tells us uh, where to go, you know, and we remember this is back, this forth. Mm -hmm. And there have been uh, several researchers during the last uh, 20 years found out different components of the uh, the uh, electrical representation of this cognitive map wow where by looking at the activity pattern you might and this is a real, is, is uh, let's say relates to rodents you might predict what how, uh, how how the animal orients itself so you have to think of this you have an internal representation of your environment mm. and the outcome is that uh, there is an area in the brain that responds uh, to uh, in a matter where the whole environment is triangulated. So we 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 have a we have a the cognitive map is made up of small and larger triangles. That's very mathematical. Yeah, it is very very. very, very that's very why it's beautiful, you know. Yes. So triangulation. It is, it is a triangulation uh, put on our space is really beautiful experiments mm. and. Associated with this is a discovery of place cells, uh, which are cells that tell you they are probably driven by these grid cells, not quite clear. They tell you where where you are. So when you are somewhere in space, a population of neuron is very, very active. So it these gives you the sense of orientation? No, it gives you, well, we don't know, but it, it, it's just an observation, but it represents internally that you know where you are, okay? Mm -hmm. So this has two components. One is the grid cell, uh -huh. where, you, where, we, uh, uh, where we get our coordinates, yes. and the subsequent um, uh, structure, it's called the hippocampus, uh, there are cells that tell you where you are. Okay. Amazing. It is really amazing. It's, uh, so, so these are three fields, three, three fields. Uh, that I found most fascinating. We're going to take a break. Yeah, okay. Well, Maybe I talk, was talking too much. No, you were not talking no, too no. much. I don't have the opportunity to talk to yeah. you at all. So, eh, vamos a hacer una pausa con el doctor eh, Bert Sackman, que nos visita aquí en Científicos Industria Argentina, y continuamos inmediatamente. Después de la pausa, seguimos conversando con Bert Sackman sobre su trabajo actual. Y momentos después, fósiles y patrimonio paleontológico. Ya volvemos.